Then President Clinton not only prevented that, not only prevented Conoco to go into Iran and develop the offshore oil field, but also imposed total sanctions on Iran. So the gesture on Rafsanjani's bar, who is one of the moderate figures within the Iranian government, uh, was rebuffed. Then when Khatami was president and everybody was talking about Iran's nuclear program, Khatami agreed to suspend Iran's uranium enrichment program. And in fact, Iran did do that from October of 2003 to February of 2006. In return, the United States and European countries were supposed to propose to Iran in uh, economic uh, in, uh, incentives and other ways so that Iran would benefit from suspension of its uranium enrichment program, but they, Iran did get, got nothing. It, it, it just got some vague promises for, for in, the, in the distant future that if Iran does this and if Iran does that, we may do this or we may do that. In other words, what they wanted to do was they wanted Iran to give up a solid fact on the ground, which was Iran's uranium enrichment program and facility at Natanz in return for some vague promises. And of course, Iran has a long history of dealing with Western powers and Russia, whereby they make all sorts of promises to Iran, and they never deliver on those promises. And the only thing they want is to get Iran to do this or to do that or to give up this or to give up that. So two moderate figures within the Iranian political establishment, one Rafsanjani in 1990s and and uh, Khatami in, 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 uh, from 1997 to 2005 tried to improve the relationship with the United States, United States. But as you pointed out, this is not what the war party in the United States wants. The war party in the United States wants war with Iran. And, and they don't settle for anything less than that. There was an article by Robert Kagan, the, the so-called brand behind Iraq invasion, in the Washington Post, where he uh, sheds crocodile tears for Iranians that how they are trying to make Iranian, uh, a new Iranian revolution and make Iran demo uh, democratic. And then in order to aid that process, he proposes to impose tough sanctions on Iran. This is the type of war party mentality that we have to deal with in this country. And as, as you said, they love to have Ahmadinejad or uh, a figure like Ahmadinejad in power because that justifies whatever they want to do to Iran. And, and, and they don't have any interest in having a moderate, reformist, forward-looking uh, leadership emerge to Iran to move Iran towards a, 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 a more open society, a more democratic a, a state, which would benefit everybody in the Middle East, and it would also be in the true national interest of the United States. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton, and I'm talking with Mohammed Sahimi. He's a professor at USC and writes for Antiwar.com. And we're talking about his recent article, Sanctions Only Hurt Ordinary Iranians. And this is the part of the show where your libertarian host says, thank God for the red Chinese. <laughs> because basically Hillary Clinton is trying to push the congressional version of these sanctions through the United Nations Security Council. And China is saying, no. Yeah, China is not interested in the sanctions for several reasons. First of all, China imports a lot of oil from the Middle East and China considers Iran basically a strategic prize in that, uh, in that area. Saudi Arabia is closely allied with the United States. Other Arab uh, countries on the Persian Gulf do have oil, but not enough of it. And therefore, Iran, uh, with its huge oil reservoir, the third largest oil reserve in the world, is uh, a strategic prize uh, as far as China is concerned. China has signed agreements with Iran to invest in Iran natural uh, gas and oil industry, if all the projects that they have agreed on to work on actually uh, are carried out, the total investment would be worth close to $100 billion, which is a very large, very large sum. At the same time, China is not interested to have Iran going back to uh, the American influence domain because that would basically complete a, a, a chain of countries uh, next to China, Afghanistan, Iran, and Iraq, that, that would be basically allied with the United States and would, uh, uh, the United States could use it to, to monitor what China does. Remember, Afghanistan has a, a small uh, common border with China. So uh, the United States' presence in Afghanistan is, also gives it the ability to monitor uh, what, what, what China does. So China is not interested in, 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 in these uh, sanctions that they are going to push through United Nations Security Council. And that's why China has resisted, and that's why in the negotiations that they had in New York a few weeks ago about how to proceed regarding Iran and its nuclear program, 
China sent a, a low-level delegation instead of its foreign minister or higher higher authority to indicate its displeasure and the fact that it doesn't want to go along with this type of uh, sanctions. At least not not at this stage. And now, whether future will bring something else, we we don't know. But at this stage, China is not interested. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I think people need to recognize uh, doing the shoe on the other foot thing. How we would react if. Any combination of powers on Earth attempted to block our importation of refined petroleum or or oil of any kind, we would nuke them all off the face of the Earth in a day. I mean, we've killed this government. Pardon me for being so loose with the term "we." This government has killed more than a million people in the name of the deaths of three thousand on September 11th. There was some kind of real blockade against this country. We would nuke capital cities. They would nuke capital cities off the face of the earth until that blockade was over. And precisely, and, and remember, we are there, or the United States is there, not because it wanted to help Iraqi people to have democracy or Afghans to have a country free of Taliban and so on, but because they want to control energy resources of that area. Remember, during the Clinton administration, when the Taliban came to power in 1996, the Clinton administration almost signed an agreement with Taliban, whereby the Taliban would allow an oil and gas pipeline from Central Asia to go to pass through Afghanistan, to go to Pakistan, so that they can bypass Iran and also control Central Asian oil, oil and natural gas. The only reason that prevented that agreement from being signed was the fact that Taliban treated women badly, and therefore the United States, having its secretary of state being a woman, Madeleine Albright, they were just basically ashamed into signing that agreement. Otherwise, they wanted to sign that agreement. Even when the September 11 terrorist attack happened, the Bush administration gave an ultimatum to the Taliban and said, if you deliver to us al-Qaeda, we won't attack you. So they still wanted to have some sort of deal with Taliban, and the only reason that didn't happen was because Taliban resisted that. But in any case, as you pointed out, the United States is there not because it's worried about democracy or anything or human rights or anything like that. It is there because it wants to control energy resources of that area. Now, the United States doesn't even need energy resources of the Middle East because the United States imports most of its oil from Canada, Mexico, and West Africa. The United States is there because it wants to control the resources so that its future rival, China, and a revived Russia cannot have access to those resources. That's why we are there, and that's why up to a million Iraqi people were killed because of, as a result of invasion, because they want to control the second largest oil reserve in the world, namely Iraq. Yeah, well, that's very well said. I think that's right, especially you know if you just uh, go back to rebuilding America's defenses, the PNAC policy paper from back then. Um, I think the oil companies were somewhat in on that, but I tend to, and maybe this is wrong, but I tend to think that the oil companies' will is more or less expressed through the point of view of uh, people like James Baker, and that um, it's not so much just about you know their profits as much as it is about the Pentagon and the long-term strategy of controlling Eurasia for the long term exactly. to keep any near-peer competitor from ever being able to uh, have any military or other influence on par with the United States anywhere in the world. Exactly. Other than in their own country. Exactly. And maybe not even then. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and, and as I said, the, the, the problem with Iran is the same thing. I mean, it's not that, for example, the, that Iran's nuclear program is any threat to uh, any physical threat to Israel or, or the United States. There is no conceivable scenario under which Iran even if armed with a nuclear warhead, will attack Israel or the United States. Because the Iranian leader, as crazy or as irrational they may, they may sound, are totally rational and calculating when it comes to their foreign policy. And they know full well that even if Iran does have a nuclear, a nuclear weapon arsenal, and there is no evidence that Iran is actually building such an arsenal, even if they have it, they, they will not attack Israel because they know very well that any attack of that sort will be matched by a counterattack by Israel that has up to 400 nuclear warheads and the United States that can evaporate Iran many, many times over. So there is no rational or any conceivable scenario under which Iran, even if it is armed with nuclear weapons, 
will attack Israel. So the question is not whether Iran is a danger to the, to the rest of the region if it is armed with nuclear weapons, 